Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And it's it's good to see you all here today. So um, someone reminded me this past week that we've been talking about the Lotus Sutra for six months, which seems like an, a long time, but we have not nearly exhausted this text. We've just touched on it. And, and today I would, as we come to the <clears throat> end of the text, I'd like to take on an ambitious task of trying to summarize some of the highlights and themes of the Lotus Sutra without any pretense of replacing the text with this summary, but just as a kind of reminder for myself and, and for, for you um, about some of the things we've discussed during this past six months. So uh, as to themes of the Lotus Sutra, well, there are many and they're, they're somewhat overlapping. But uh, I've, I've sort of distilled several. First, the theme of diversity. Sorry, that was unavoidable. The second, uh, the theme of skillful means. The third, inclusiveness. The fourth is timelessness. The fifth, Buddha nature. The seventh, the, sec the sixth, ungraspability or immensity. The seventh, the relationship between compassion and emptiness. And lastly, number eight, refuge. There's much more going on in the Lotus Sutra than these things, but these are the, some of the things that came to mind when I was trying to think about themes. So we'll go through them one at a time and we'll see how far we get today. So this theme of diversity is very obvious and prominent in the Lotus Sutra. At the very beginning, there there is a description, a detailed description of all these various creatures, human and non-human, who are on vulture's peak, listening to the Buddha. And uh, as, as a reminder, I'll just read this passage where it describes at least some of these beings. If one's tongue is used to preach to the, in the assembly, it will produce a deep and wonderful voice that can enter into hearts, giving people pleasure and joy. And when sons and daughters of heaven, Indra, Brahma, and the other gods hear this deep and wonderful voice speaking clearly, they will all come and listen. Male and female dragons, male and female satyrs, male and female centaurs, male and female asuras, male and female griffins, male and female chimeras, male and female pythons will all come to hear the Dharma and to associate with, revere and make offerings to such a person. Monks and nuns, laymen and laywomen, kings and princes with their ministers and followers, and minor and great wheel-turning kings with their seven treasures, their thousand princes, 
and with their inner and outer followings, all will come riding in their palaces to listen to the Dharma. So a diversity that cuts across gender and socioeconomic lines and all other kinds of divisions that we place upon individuals. And then in the parable of the plants, the moisture reaches all the plants, trees, thickets, forests, and medicinal herbs with their little roots, little stems, little branches, little leaves, their medium-sized roots, medium-sized stems, and medium-sized branches, medium-sized leaves, their big roots, big stems, big branches, and big leaves, every tree, large or small, according to whether it is superior, middling, or inferior, receives its share. The rain from the same cloud goes to each, according to its nature and kind, causing it to grow, bloom, and bear fruit. Though all grow in the same soil and are moistened by the same rain, these plants and trees are all different. So this sutta, sutra rather, is addressed to all. And you can see why it was particularly po popular among lay, lay followers. The second theme I'll talk about is skillful means. And oftentimes the Lotus Sutra is said to be just about skillful means. And that's illustrated by probably the most well-known uh, parable in the Lotus Sutra, the parable of the burning house, where uh, the father, in order to entice his children out of the house uh, lists various of their favorite toys in order to get them outside. And then when they are outside and safe, he presents them with something far greater. The analogy being, being between the various teachings, the various ways of expressing the Dharma, as being skillful means, a way of pointing to, a, a direction to the ultimate dharma, the one vehicle dharma. And then there's the parable of the fantastic castle in which the leader of a group is trying to get his followers to a distant location where they can be free and joyful, but they get tired along the way. So he creates in his imagination and the imagination of his followers this fantastic city midway where they can rest and regain their strength so they can continue on their journey. Again, an illustration of skillful means. And this little selection Shariputra, all these Buddhas only teach bodhisattvas that their purpose is to demonstrate the Buddha's insight to living beings, to enable living beings to apprehend things with the insight of a Buddha, and to enable living beings to enter into the way of the Buddha's insight using various devices. So a third theme is that of inclusiveness, which is 
in some ways already addressed, but it's made very clear in various chapters of the Lotus Sutra that there is, in fact, universal salvation. So there's a chapter in which Mahaprajna and Yoshadara are assured that they will become Buddhas. This was the aunt who was the uh, essentially the uh, the caretaker of the Buddha when he was a child of um, Shakyamuni Buddha. And the Buddha's wife. So women were included, which was contrary to the cultural norm of the time. And then there's the story about the dragon princess, who was only, what, eight years old or 12 years old, I can't remember. So the young youth were included, and not just the elderly and supposedly wise. And then there was the story about Devadatta, the notorious figure who at, on several occasions tried to kill the Buddha, and that being unsuccessful, he tried to divide the Buddha's Sangha, the Buddha's followers and create unrest, a decisive a divisiveness within the Buddha's community. And he also was assured that he would one day become a Buddha, as well as the 500 monks who walked out on the Buddha's first lecture, the first talk about the Dharma Flower Sutra, the Lotus Sutra. Those 500 monks who walked out out of arrogance were also assured that they too would become Buddhas. As it's cited in the parable of the plants, those who have not yet been saved will be saved. Those who have not yet been set free will be set free. And those who have had no rest will have rest. Those who have not yet attained nirvana will attain nirvana. So inclusiveness, really radical inclusiveness, is a theme of the Lotus Sutra. And then there's the theme of timelessness. With these great expanses of time, these countless eons that pass, these impossibly long lifespans of some of the individuals discussed. Clearly, the Lotus Sutra is not a historical record, and it's certainly not a philosophic thesis. It's a collection of stories, and images, similes, verses. That are to be used as a guide. And it takes us through vast expanses of time and also space. In the chapter, The Lifetime of the Tathagata, you should all listen carefully to hear about the Tathagata's secret and divine powers. In all the worlds, the humans, heavenly beings, and asuras think that the present Shakyamuni Buddha left the palace of the Chakra clan, sat at the place of the way not far from the city of Gaia, and attain supreme awakening. But, my good sons, in fact, there have been innumerable, unlimited, hundreds and thousands 
of billions of myriads of eons since I became a Buddha. And then there's the, the theme of Buddha nature, which is not specifically a phrase that's not specifically used anywhere in the Lotus Sutra, but seems to be referred to in the sense that all beings are on a path, however tortuous, to becoming Buddhas and have within them this potential. There's a parable of the poor son who in adolescence leaves his father's house, his wealthy father, and goes off on his own, suffering great poverty, and then returns later. His father has moved to a different location, and the son doesn't recognize his father when he goes up to look for work. His father, however, recognizes him and gives him a job cleaning the barns, which he does for many, many, many years. And finally, at the end of the story, ends up inheriting his father's wealth. Material wealth here, an obvious symbol for spiritual wealth. And then there's the parable of the jewel and the robe, where a good friend sews a jewel into the robe of his wandering friend. And his wandering friend, again, wanders about in great poverty for many, many years and encounters the first friend again and uh, is informed that all this time he has had this robe with a jewel sewn in it that he's been wearing, cashing in the robe, the uh, jewel he was able to live comfortably. And, and then there's the expanding on this notion of Buddha nature the story about never disrespecting Bodhi Bodhisattva. After extinction of the first majestic voice king, Tathagata, and after the end And after the end of the true Dharma, during the period of the merely formal Dharma, extremely arrogant monks had great power. And at that time, there was a Bodhisattva monk named Never Disrespectful. Great strength, why do you think he was named Never Disrespectful? That monk bowed in obeisance before everyone he met, whether monk, nun, layman, or laywoman, and praised them saying, I deeply respect you. I would never dare to be disrespectful or arrogant toward you. Why? Because all of you are practicing the Bodhisattva way and surely will become Buddhas. And this never disrespectful Bodhisattva monk turns out to be a former life of the Buddha. So the notion of universal Buddha nature. And then there's the theme of non-graspability. Non-graspability, which is really uh, throughout the Lotus Sutra with all of these immense spaces, immense distances, this immensity of space and time, this total inability to comprehend all of the scenes that are being described. And the fact that the 
Lotus Sutra itself is never really spelled out. The whole Lotus Sutra text is about the Dharma Flower Sutra, is about the Lotus Sutra, but we never see the content, the text of the Lotus Sutra. It's a sutra about itself. So ultimately, the Dharma Flower Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, is unspoken. Not because it's concealed, but because it is beyond words. So the Lotus Sutra itself is a skillful means. And then there's the relationship of emptiness to compassion. Now, the Lotus Sutra doesn't really emphasize the notion of emptiness. That's not what it's about. In contrast, uh, sutras like the Diamond Sutra are just all about emptiness. That's all they discuss. But the Lotus Sutra just once or twice refers to the notion of emptiness. In this passage from Teachers of the Dharma, Medicine King, after the extinction of the Tathagata, if there are good sons or good daughters who want to teach the Dharma Flower Sutra for the four groups, that would be monks, nuns, lay women, and lay men. How should they teach it? Such good sons or daughters should enter the room of the Tathagata, put on the robe of the Tathagata, and sit on the seat of the Tathagata, and then teach this sutra everywhere for the four groups. <clears throat> he goes on to explain, the Buddha does, to enter the room of the Tathagata, is to have great compassion for all living beings. To wear the robe of the Tathagata is to be gentle and patient. To sit on the seat of the Tathagata is to contemplate the emptiness of all things. One should dwell in peace with all three and then, never becoming lazy or careless, teach the Dharma Flower Sutra everywhere to bodhisattvas and the four groups. And, and finally, there's the theme of refuge. Ever-present refuge. And this comes out in many places throughout the Lotus Sutra. Including this selection from the lifetime of the Tathagata. In order to liberate the living as a skillful means, I appear to enter nirvana. Yet truly, I am not extinct. I am always here teaching the Dharma. I am always here, but due to my divine powers, perverse living beings fail to see me, even though I am close. And when the living beings have become faithful, honest, upright, and gentle, and wholeheartedly want to see the Buddha, even at the cost of their own lives, then, together with the assembly of monks, I appear on Holy Eagle Peak, Vulture's Peak. And then I tell all the living that I am always here, not extinct. Yet, by the power of skillful means, I reveal both extinction and non-extinction.
And in this chapter about the bodhisattvas arising from the earth, the Buddha has been offered the assistance of bodhisattvas from other worlds. But he responds, enough, my good sons, there is no need for you to protect and embrace this sutra. Why? Because in my world itself, there are many bodhisattva great ones, as there are sands in 60,000 Ganges. And each one of these bodhisattvas has many followers, as there are sands in 60,000 Ganges. So there are bodhisattvas everywhere. Here in this Saha world and the world we live in, countless bodhisattvas in all different kinds of forms, human and non-human perhaps, bodhisattvas everywhere. And then in the one of the most famous chapters of the Lotus Sutra, chapter number 25, about Avalokiteshvara, which is translated here, Bodhisattva regarder of the cries of the world. At that time, the Bodhisattva inexhaustible mind got up from his seat, bared his right shoulder, put his palms together facing the Buddha and said, world honored one, for what reason does the Bodhisattva regarder of the cries of the world have the name regarder of the cries of the world? The Buddha answered in exhaustible mind, Bodhisattva. Good son, he said, if there were countless hundreds of thousands of billions of living beings experiencing suffering and agony, who heard of this regarder of the cries of the world, Bodhisattva, and wholeheartedly called his or her name. Regarder of the cries of the world, Bodhisattva, would immediately hear their cries, and all of them would be freed. Inexhaustible mind, such are the blessings attained by the, guard, uh, by the regarder of the cries of the world, Bodhisattva, and the various forms in which she travels ab around in many lands to save the living. This is why all of you should wholeheartedly make offerings to the regarder of the cries of the world, Bodhisattva. This regarder of the cries of the world, Bodhisattva, this great one is able to bestow freedom from fear on those who are faced with frightening, urgent, and difficult situations. That is why in this world, everyone gives her the name bestower of freedom from fear. So ultimately, there are so many things that the Lotus Sutra is about, but at least some of it is about refuge, about the availability of refuge of comfort in a difficult world, of the ability to transcend afflictions and to overcome fear. The initial teachings of the Buddha in the Four Noble Truths may suggest that one could completely avoid all dukkha all unpleasant uh, unpleasant uh, experiences, uh, all difficulties in life by becoming unattached, renouncing desire. At least that's one interpretation. 
the Lotus Sutra is guiding us to something beyond that. Where the inevitability of difficulties and afflictions are recognized. But the ever-present ability to transcend these is available. The Lotus Sutra is pointing us in that direction. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and um, we'll uh, go into uh, breakout rooms for a few minutes. And, and maybe if you can uh, just think about any episodes of the Lotus Sutra or any um, images that you can recall that have stuck with you um, or any instances in your life which you somehow relate to the teachings of the Lotus Sutra. And we'll get back together in a few minutes. Thank you very much for listening.